Thank you. Uh, thanks, everyone, um, for coming. Thanks, um, Katie, for organising this day and for inviting me. It's been um, a really invigorating day, and it's been great to uh, reflect and prise apart what we mean by this term precarity um, and to hear about uh, people's uh, empirical research on this. And it's really been helpful for thinking about how we might sort of critically theorise uh, new forms of precarity, what they look like in 21st century Britain, and where we might apply this concept to this empirical research. Um, I'm not going to add to these definitions um, in this presentation per se, but what I am going to do is um, reflect on the kinds of representational spaces that have been carved out around this term precarity. Um, and in particular, I want to think about the kind of media uh, and cultural spaces where experiences of and stories about precarity and precarious life are being represented. And really to think about the kind of politics of those representations as well. So to think about how precarity gets represented <coughs> how those uh, stories uh, and narratives get scripted and with what kinds of effects. Um, so really to think about representational politics. Um, today we've heard a lot and I'm interested in the experiences of precariousness and what life is like when paid employment is insecure, um, when welfare benefits are inadequate or unreliable uh, or increasingly, when they might be sanctioned, they might disappear for any number of weeks. And um, we sort of know already and we've heard a lot of research today about how these experiences are extending uh, to, more, to more people as employment changes and particularly as the new rounds of so-called welfare reforms um, are being enacted. But the focus of the research that I'm going to talk about today is not so much about those experiences as it is about the ways in which media narratives about precarity get developed and shaped and written and filmed and broadcast and published. Um, and to think about those kind of narratives, those stories, those scripts and those representations of precarity through that lens of cultural studies. Um, and particularly, this is important at this moment, a moment when public and political debate about poverty, about inequality, about precarity, about the future of the welfare state itself are intensifying. And particularly at this moment when um, the experience of being precarious is extending to more and more people and at the same time uh, a new anti-welfare common sense um, has been hardening. So this term, um, anti-welfare common sense, is one that I've used to refer to the ways that poverty and precarity are increasingly talked about as if they're caused by individuals, um, as if they're the result of individual irresponsibility, unwillingness to work, lack of aspiration, um, inability to plan ahead and so on. So this kind of common sense um, idea states that if you are precarious it must be because you lack something, right? because you have some kind of deficit. Um, and as sociologists, we know it's more complicated than that. And yet this deficit model has been enthusiastically drawn upon um, to justify a more punitive approach to welfare, more conditional forms of social support, um, in short, to justify policies that in themselves create insecurity. As sociologists, we know that there's been a hardening of attitudes towards the welfare state and towards welfare benefit claimants. We know from social attitude surveys that public attitudes have shifted, that over the last 30 years, uh, neoliberal social policy has embedded this more conditional and punitive approach to welfare. It's reduced the value of welfare payments in real terms. So in 1979, one of my favourite factoids that I always give my students, um, unemployment benefits were worth 23% of the average income, now they're worth 11%. Um, and we know that while this has been happening, while there's been a reduction in social security, there's also been this hardening, this common sense that welfare is still too generous, it's still too easy to claim that people are living lives of luxury, they're choosing welfare dependency over paid employment, dependency is passed from generation to generation, all the kind of stuff that Rock's research takes apart. We know that this anti-welfare common sense doesn't map onto the reality of precarious lives, um, and yet these attitudes continue to harden, um, and this common sense continues to solidify. Um, what we don't, as sociologists, tend to explore so much um, is the cultural mechanisms through which that common sense becomes hardened. Um, how does it get produced? How does it get circulated? How does it get solidified? Um, what does media do? Um, and as sociologists, we don't tend to ask that. What does it make sensible? What does it make common sense? So common sense, this kind of this idea, the widely circulated and repeated ideas that becomes harder and harder to think outside of. Um, so these common sense ideas uh, around welfare and the welfare state that welfare doesn't solve poverty, that it doesn't solve insecurity or precarity, but rather it creates it. So this is the kind of common sense ideas that we're working with. 
Um, the research that I'm involved in at the moment, and it's quite interesting to give a keynote on research that you've not actually started yet. So we're starting it in the autumn, but we've already started to map out some of the kind of preliminary strands in this research. Um, and it's work that I'm involved in with Kim Allen and Sarah De Benedictus. So I just want to give them a heads up that this is work that's very collaborative. And it locates media as a crucial constituent in the crafting of these new neoliberal forms of anti-welfare common sense. Um, and what we want to do is to start tracking um, the emergence of a new genre of factual television um, that we've put at the centre of the project. Um, in the, the kind of the research official paperwork and everything, we've called it welfare programming, but we all know it more commonly as poverty porn television. Um, and there are many reasons why it's become known as poverty porn, which I'll talk about um, a bit later, but it fits at the intersection between reality TV and documentary. Um, and needless to say, producers of this programming don't describe it as poverty porn, they reject this label. Um, but I do use this term and I you know, defend my use of this term because I think it usefully captures uh, what it does, how it orients viewers and the kinds of emotional invitations that it makes of its viewers, the pleasurable sensations that it creates around anger and disgust, but also more complexly, empathy and pity. So such television has shown its capacity to attract high audience ratings and to generate controversy across social media and national newspapers. Um, and there have been a range of interpretations about what it does as well. So commissioners state confidently that viewers love this kind of television, that it's entertaining and illuminating. Producers uh, talk about how they're lifting the lid on the hidden realities um, of life with poverty. Broadcasters have described this kind of television as fulfilling a public service remit to inform and educate their audiences. And politicians, of course, have absolutely lapsed this genre up and they've suggested that these programmes reveal the true extent of problems facing poor communities and in particular the true extent of welfare dependency. And there are of course other critical interpretations from anti-poverty campaigns and organisations which have highlighted how it's voyeuristic, sensationalist uh, in its presentation of precarious people. Um, there are precursors to this um, genre, so BBC uh, broadcast Skin in 2005, but the genre really explodes and it really takes off in 2013 and this date is important. Um, just as the Welfare Reform Act of 2012 starts to get implement, uh, implemented, we get the most radical restructuring of the welfare state in its entire history. Uh, Mike talked earlier about the two shifts uh, around welfare in the last 100 years, 1945 and 1979. 2012 is the kind of third shift as well, so we get a really radical dismantling. Um, a welfare dispossession, uh, an ideologically driven set of structural adjustments and austerity policies, an encroachment of, um, upon the welfare entitlements that were themselves part of the post-war settlement that were undermined in 1979, um, that were supposed to cushion us against the excesses and risks of capitalism and its insecurity. Um, so the Welfare Reform Act is an, is an act of welfare dispossession through which welfare claimants are being steadily disowned and objected by normative powers. And this was a government act which sought to produce precaritisation. And we're only really beginning to understand the implications um, and the effects of this act. So it's really important that poverty porn explodes at this point. Um, 2012, the act passes through Parliament. 2013, it starts to get implemented. 2013, the year that we start to see an explosion of TV about precarity. So I'm just going to offer a very condensed history uh, of what uh, poverty porn looked like, where it came from. Um, so first of all, we have this, Repay Your Benefits. Um, program which invited four taxpayers to analyse the spending habits of uh, four welfare claimants. Um, in August, we get Benefits Britain 1949. Again, setting benefit claimants the challenge of living by the benefit rules of 1949, the first year of the welfare state. Uh, again, very familiar narratives get set up about welfare dependency um, and that benefit claimants today are indulged. Um, in October, on Benefits and Proud gets broadcast, part of Channel 5's And Proud series, which I always like to say included Shoplifters and Proud and Pickpockets and Proud. Um, and it's sort of suggesting how dare they be proud, they should be ashamed. Um, then we get uh, Britain on the Fiddle, um, which follows benefit fraud officers as they investigate claims of fraud. Um, uh, and we also get, this, is, this program's riddled with inaccuracy, um, and it's uh, quite interesting that it's part of the Panorama Current Affairs uh, series given how riddled with inaccuracy it is. Um, we then get Benefit Street which is the kind of apex really of poverty porn. This is the moment where poverty porn starts to really accelerate. Uh, it was a surprise hit for Channel 4 and it delivered 
incredibly valuable media currency, the, cur the currency of attention. Um, and there was constant newspaper coverage of the participants, the street, the people associated with them, the commentary from columnists. They were the subject of talk radio. It trended on Twitter after every single broadcast. And viewer figures rose after each episode. So this was um, really a kind of, you know, a, a huge hit. And it really, we really start to see poverty porn accelerate after the broadcast of this. Uh, contemporary media culture is quite parasitical. So once a popular format uh, or genre gets established, there are all of these attempts to feed off it and to capitalise on its success. Um, and we see how Benefit Street got quickly used to create satellite event TV. Channel 5, keen to cash in on the attention currency, set up Big Benefits Row, while Channel 4 broadcast its own Benefits Britain, the live debate. Um, both debates featured social commentators, journalists and politicians, uh, but neither included a single social scientist, uh, economist, historian of welfare, or indeed anyone who might be considered uh, an expert on precarity and on poverty. And there was a bit of a campaign to get Rob on, on one of these, but I don't know, it didn't happen. It's a shame. So this is a kind of media bubble of sort of recycled mythologies and opinion, professional opinion havers. And we, we might remember as well that this is the kind of birth of Katie, uh, Katie Hopkins as a kind of professional opinion haver. So this new value that's uh, attached to opinion rather than expertise. After that, we get uh, benefits, Britain's benefit tenants, people who claim housing benefit and live in privately rented accommodation. Um, and again, this kind of red flag term, benefit tenant <coughs> rather than social housing tenant, tells us something about the kind of mythologies that get reproduced across this programme. We get Benefits Britain, Life on the Dole, a six episode example of fast television commissioned by Channel 5. Uh, and Channel 5 really become expert poverty porn producers and they recycle and solidify these kind of popular mythologies about welfare, and they've perfected this kind of fa fast media approach to documentary. Filming's now happening over a matter of days rather than over a matter of weeks or months. Um, this is a, a this points to the importance of casting um, and how particular groups of claimants get cast, and the importance of that job in poverty porn is really clear. Um, so the, there's particular groups, single mothers, large families, migrants, who get uh, sort of consciously cast as symbols of controversy and um, they become figures of disgust in the new common sense um, of welfare. So again kind of scripting precarity and poverty in very particular ways. Um, the On Benefits series proved so successful for Channel 5 that they commissioned a second series titled Depending on the Dole which has been broadcast throughout this year and you can see the kind of inventiveness of the genre where it's starting to go um, and even more examples here of poverty porn um, from 2015. I really can't keep up with 2016. Um, again, the kind of inventiveness of this genre, the capacity of television producers to find new hybrid opportunities um, with which to capitalise on this kind of media currency of attention and to offer something that seems new um, or, depending on your interpretation, to find more and more absurd ways to extend this genre. Um, we can see again the repetition of particular kinds of scapegoats. So the figures of disgust who keep emerging again and again. In this case, we get Roma gypsies, anti-migrant, um, and anti-gypsy and racist fears played on. Um, there's also, we can see how TV producers have drawn on wider social disgust around fat and overweight bodies. Mm -hmm. And finally, how existing fears around weapon dogs and puppy breeding and other kinds of status dogs get attached to poverty porn. If anyone's got any more examples, please tweet me or email me them, because we're trying to build a database and we're finding it hard to keep up. So... How can we understand um, this proliferation of TV which places benefits and poverty and precarity mm -hmm. at its centre? How might we theorise the acceleration of this genre? Um, and to make sense of this, I've been returning to the kind of cultural studies end of sociology, uh, or thinking sociologically through cultural studies, that tradition of British cultural studies, going back to um, some of that critical work around popular culture, and particularly the work of Stuart Hall, which has just been absolutely invigorating, uh, policing the crisis, uh, in which him and his colleagues were interested in this figure, the mugger, um, who, and con they were concerned with a new kind of crime, mugging, which emerged in the 70s, uh, and upon whom street crime gets racialised and social anxieties around youth and urban space and control get projected. Um, and as they argue compellingly in this book, um, figures like the mugger <coughs> are essential at times of crisis. Uh, when new formations of common sense are condensing and solidifying. Um, and it's interesting to think about how their analysis of the mugger might map onto similar 
figures are discussed now, like the benefit claimant or the scrounger. Um, what are the new form, forms of common sense um, and how are they being driven forward through different bits of popular culture, different bits of um, official and public disquiet, uh, public conversation? And how do new figures of social disgust and recycled old figures of social disgust as well, um, how do they get produced and circulated? Um, and what do they legitimate as well? So there's a real appetite across uh, political and media culture to talk about scroungers, to talk about skivers, and to draw on these very divisive um, vocabularies of virtue and waste, uh, rather than to examine the kind of common costs of neoliberalism, the common costs of precarity. Um, and so this othering of the scrounger, the claimant, um, the welfare dependent claimant in particular, we know that that's not how welfare works. We know that there's a much more porous movement between being on benefits and not being on benefits, being in work and not being in work. And yet these new cultural figures um, populate uh, popular culture. And they tell us something about the repetitions. Um, and I'm going to give you just a little quote from Police in the Crisis. And I'm going to replace the word crime with the word welfare. And you can see how prescient this book was. Public opinion about welfare does not simply form at random. It exhibits a shape and a structure. It follows a sequence. It's a social process. Even at its lowest threshold of visibility, in talk, in rumour, in the exchange of quick views and common sense judgments, welfare talk is not socially innocent. Um, in connected ways, other sociologists have made parallel arguments about how we might connect up the emergence, the acceleration of this highly profitable reality television subgenre, um, to think about what television uh, that names itself around benefits does, um, and to approach poverty porn as a kind of television which is part of a stigma machine, and this is Imogen Tyler's most recent work around stigma, how the very word benefits um, has come to open up a cultural industry that's predicated on disgust and hatred, um, how they seem to offer uh, new or recycle old vocabularies about the underclass, um, and how we might think about um, poverty porn as uh, part of a classificatory apparatus. So how does, uh, me how does media, popular culture intervene into social relations? So this kind of very cultural studies 101, the media doesn't simply reflect the world, it constructs it. So we need to be critically oriented to the documentary of documentary television. Um, and this cultural studies end of sociology, uh, which locates media as a crucial constituent of social <coughs> power, um, is very helpful um, for thinking about poverty porn. Um, the important thing to think about um, in terms of theorising this genre is that it is a, a cultural industry. Um, so it's not TV craft, as we might think of it um, in the past, but it's a kind of TV franchise, uh, a highly successful business model. So find people in poverty in an austerity regime, that's not very hard, um, who are affected by cuts to the welfare state, offer to tell their story, uh, lift the lid on welfare, put benefits in the title and, you know, guaranteed, watch your ratings climb. So this kind of TV is very fast to make, small camera crew, uh, it's quite cheap to make, none of the part participants in the programme get paid, of course if they did they would be at risk of losing their benefits, and using that word benefit in the title uh, has proven to be an easy way for fast media to capitalise on the kind of media currency that's generated by previous incarnations of the, of the genre. So this is a kind of cultural franchise driven by the conceit that you can parachute in a small film crew, film intensively for a very short amount of time, it is now down to a matter of days, uh, edit a story quickly by recycling already successful narratives, solidify the story with a repetitive voiceover and be ready to broadcast uh, within weeks. So we do have quite an interesting body of work which explores uh, representations of poverty and welfare um, and it thinks about the kind of social and political effects of those representations, looks at the portrayal of precarity itself, the programme, or what we would say in cultural studies, the text. Um, but our argument, and what we want to do in this research, is to look at um, the conditions of industrialised media production and the broader political economy in which these texts emerge. So we say that sociology needs to connect <coughs> representations of class and poverty and welfare to questions of production. Imogen Tyler says, when undertaking class analysis, it is inadequate to examine television media, either in terms of the programme content or audience preferences alone. So we're trying to step back from poverty porn as being simply portrayals of precarity and also think about them as products of a media sphere that is itself precarious. Um, and to ask how 
are these programmes made? What forms of labour, what forms of production processes are involved in making them? Who makes them? Um, and how do decisions get made about how to narrate and script particular common sense ideas about poverty? So we're asking a different set of questions which attempt to link up the economics of poverty porn um, and cultural workers and cultural labour and production processes with the narratives and the common sense scripts about poverty and welfare and precarity. So how do low risk programmes get made which recycle and draw on and repeat easy to digest scripts? How can we understand that in terms of an economics? Um, so I'm going to talk just very quickly about uh, a few issues and themes that we've been thinking about through developing a kind of critical labour studies approach to poverty porn. Uh, things that we want to explore in terms of the economic forces of industrial media production and the change in working conditions of media workers who may themselves be precariously employed, and they often are, um, may themselves be involved in low wage or no wage work, um, and how these uh, conditions of production shape the stories that are produced about precarity. In short, to ask what connects the dispossessed cultural worker from the dispossession TV that they make. Um, there's been a number of really interesting studies which have noted that the cultural and creative industries are marked by entrenched patterns of inequality uh, in, relation, in relation to gender, race, social class, through the use of unpaid work, internships, networking, word of mouth recruitment, which all work as a form of social closure. They close down the possibilities of entering that world of work. Um, in regards to TV and film, there's been a whole range of really interesting reports which have emphasised that all of these industries suffer from a social mobility problem. They suffer from recruitment uh, problems. Um, so, for example, with 19% of those working in film and independent TV um, attended an independent or a fee-paying school, and that compares to 7% of the general population. So there's an over-recruiting um, from a disproportionately privileged cultural <coughs> workforce. Um, and that's something that we need to think about, right? So there's a concentration of privately and Oxbridge-educated people in senior positions in the cultural industries as well. Um, so people who have power as symbol makers are drawn from an increasingly narrow strata of the UK population. Um, and this is something which causes a great deal of anxiety um, in the higher levels of these industries. Um, there's a highly defensive and complex um, discussions that are happening which are very anxious about uh, precisely how socially closed these industries are. So a Guardian event um, at the Edinburgh International Film Festival um, shows some of the tensions and contradictions regarding the class composition of this workforce. Um, and there's an attempt to kind of defend against this and justify against criticisms of exploitation and class tourism. Um, but there's also this kind of invoking of a colonial and anthropological gaze. Um, and again, othering. So we've, we've already talked about othering today, the kind of cultural othering that happens as the middle class cultural worker defends their fascination to dip into and represent the world of precarious people who are shown in poverty porn. Um, but there's also complexities there as well. So uh, one of the participants of this panel references her family history as a way of kind of saying, well, you know, um, there's not so much of a power imbalance between cultural workers and those that we're representing. Um, and Tom, um, who I've also included at the bottom there, um, leans on this idea that, well, we're all precarious, so, you know, therefore we're able to make, um, you know, television about precarity. So flattening out the experience of uh, class in contemporary Britain. So when considering how and why certain representations um, of poverty and precarity get made, we're saying it is important to think about who gets to be a cultural producer, who gets to author scripts about precarity, um, but also we want to think about how the broader conditions of industrialised cultural production also shape the kinds of scripts that we get as well. So we know that work itself, the very idea of a career, the very notion of security and stability and a job for life is fraying. Um, and the fantasy of the good life, the future, planned, reliable, predictable, it's fraying for lots of us. Um, and cultural work is also marked by this kind of creeping precarity. Uh, and this has effects for the cultural scripts that cultural workers feel able to produce and distribute. Um, and we know that the television climate of commissioning and broadcasting has been marked by a greater competitiveness. Um, the whole idea of public service broadcasting is under sustained mm -hmm. attack with the BBC Review Charter. Um, and there are all sorts of implications uh, on these uh, industrial shifts 
for people working here. So cultural work is marked by job insecurity, informality, portfolio careers. You're only as good as your last job. And that leads to a sense of anxiety amongst cultural workers. Uh, Onamik Saha's work has found that for British Asian um, cultural workers who go into cultural work hoping to challenge some of the scripts around Asianness, get kind of um, compromised. Um, and they find themselves compromised by a fear of not getting the next job. And they themselves find themselves complicit in producing limited and stigmatising portrayals of Asianness, despite being driven by you know, political and ethical urges to challenge these kinds of representations. So cultural workers are constrained, they're regulated by these market logics, by these commercial imperatives. These things have epistemological effects on how ethnicity gets consumed and understood by audiences. And we might also say how class gets consumed and understood by audiences. Um, similarly, Lee's research demonstrates that while independent television producers are driven by ethical commitments to make content that has a social and civic purpose, um, they uh, get compromised by these sort of entrenched neoliberal values within the sector um, and their subjectivities connect to the political economy and the structuring of, of the industry and in the forms and modes of creativity that are allowed within it. So there are a number of conflicting values in the accounts of cultural workers that are involved in the production of this kind of genre and that's what we want to explore. Um, these kind of conflicts between we just film what we see, we just you know, turn the camera on and film what we see, we're being authentic, um, it's a kind of democratic culture um, which is just providing a kind of unmediated account of lives um, that are precarious. But at the same time, there are these tensions where people are, you know, do speak um, about the kind of conflicting pressures of production. They know that there's a commercial imperative um, that's driving the creation of particular scripts. And they know that they have to attract audiences through interesting content and they have to grab people's attention um, in order to attract and maintain audiences. So I like this uh, quote from Guy Davis who says, we have to write headlines for our titles. So they know that they're involved in this kind of, um, this very particular fast media world which operates through attention. And they know that their future work relies on making noise, creating a buzz, generating controversy. And that puts them in all sorts of compromising uh, positions. And that's the, the conflicting pressures of production um, and the desires to make a different kind of television, how these tensions work uh, in the re in, is something we're going to pick up on in the research. So poverty porn is this new kind of cultural industry. It's praised for its ability to kick up a media storm. Um, it's seen to hold great economic value. It's cheap, profitable to make. Um, it works within an attention economy. It produces all of these possibilities for making parasitical media content. And there's a range of agents within it who are able to accumulate capital. And we want to open up and think about where does the money get generated? Where does value get extracted? Um, so broadcasters are able to maximise their advertising revenue streams through swelling these audience numbers. Benefit Street delivered Channel 4 with its highest viewing figures in 2014. And it created advertising space. Benefit Street alone created advertising space that was worth £1 million. Um, we also know production companies are able to consolidate uh, their economic capital through this genre. So Love Productions that made Benefit Street saw their annual profits increase by 25% in the year that they broadcast Benefit Street alone. Uh, Keogh Films were able to capitalise on the uh, success of Skin, which was broadcast in 2013. And they franchised this format to Australia as Struggle Street, which again kind of reproduced particular mythologies about uh, welfare dependency. Newspapers are able to draw on the debate and to produce parasitical content. Um, and of course, there are all sorts of possibilities for cross media, um, value extraction and consolidation. So, Sky News International recently bought out Love Productions. Uh, no newspapers, magazines, public relations industries can profit from the new micro celebrities that are produced. So, some of those micro celebrities that we've seen, White D, for example, Benefit Street has gone on to have a micro-celebrity life. Cultural workers are able to enhance their portfolio by making explosive TV. And of course, programme participants, although this is more complex and this is something that we want to be very careful about, are able to extract some value from appearing in these programmes. Um, poverty porn draws on parasitical attention as a form of capital accumulation. Um, and as such, as uh, uh, 
uh, Bev Skeggs and Helen Wood remind us, um, television has proven highly adept at finding new markets, enabling new forms of exploitation. Um, and I particularly like the final bit of this um, quote where they say, reality television therefore extracts value in different ways from the performances of unpaid participants. Um, and they talk about how this lubricates the operations of capital. So they're very much interested in situating this within an economic, a, capital, uh, a capitalist, um, industrialised media production and to think about how does this operate in the, in the interest of capital. As they further argue, it's the use of ordinary people marshalled from audiences into production regimes <coughs> that intensify these possibilities for exploitation. Those who appear on poverty porn profit far less. So Dee Kelly um, states about her participation in Benefit Street, it's like Big Brother, except no one is evicted or paid. <laughs> Which I think is just a great quote. Um, so what do the um, conflicting values around poverty porn and production open up and close down uh, in telling different stories about precarity? Um, and this is an event that Kim, uh, my research colleague, went to, which was um, a really interesting event about poverty porn and production um, where participants were asked to fill in a kind of story arc. Um, so they were asked to think about how you would write a story arc for a particular character. How would you write the hero's journey? Um, and this is quite an interesting um, example of the ways in which industrialised media production draws on long-held, formulaic, commercially successful narrative framings, how it individualises poverty rather than looks to long-term structural inequalities, how it calls on the good, heroic, working-class subject who's going to overcome inequality, um, who's going to make good, work hard, and ultimately get off benefits. So that's the kind of story arc that they're always looking for in casting. Um, what this does, of course, is it lacks nuance. It reifies a whole range of myths and common sense. It smooths out the contradictions over poverty, which are existing under austerity. Um, and they smooth out all of those contradictions that have been highlighted today, you know, that uh, falling in and out of benefits or moving into hard work doesn't pay. Um, and that there is this kind of cycle, this churn of moving in and out of benefits, which is just not really captured in these common sense scripts. All of these complex pressures that are brought to bear on cultural workers to grab audiences, to create a buzz, to make noise, to write headlines for the titles, to generate that valuable currency of media attention, points to a broader sense of precarity. So precarity is not simply something over there in those people's lives, in that place, in front of the camera. Um, it's also something that's powerfully shaping the motivations of the people who are doing the filming, the editing, uh, doing the sound, casting. Um, and what we want to do in this um, research project is explore those feelings of insecurity, uh, that you're only as good as your last job, that your value is bound up with the kind of noise you can generate, uh, the kind of value you can consolidate for all of these different actors. Um, and to think about the kinds of effects that those pressures exert on the processes of cultural production and the representations that we ultimately see. Uh, the final thing that I want to talk about is just to say how important it is that we link representations of precarity to the precarious cultural workers who are making them and to think about how and where these moments and contradictions become visible, the moments where this apparatus of poverty porn production becomes part of the story. Um, so here in the second season of Benefit Street, there's lots of examples, but I thought I'd use this one because it was filmed just down the road, of course. Um, and uh, several press photographers uh, turn up during filming and they start photographing the street. Um, and Julie and Sue challenge the photographers, and the photographers are quite rude to them. Um, but first of all, they ignore them, then they just sort of talk quite dismissively to them. Things get quite heated, people start coming out of their houses. And Sue delivers quite a powerful speech about how it's not Benefit Street that's ex exploiting them, it's the press. Um, and this is a really interesting moment which kind of opens up some of those tensions, it opens up the apparatus of poverty porn. Um, it's only about a minute um, and it's on, available on the website under public relations. Um, and it exposes this kind of apparatus, it appears to set up the photographers who it turns out are from the sun uh, as exploitative and the Benefit Street cameraman as benign um, it appears to rehearse a kind of solidarity between the Benefit Street 
film crew and the residents against these outsiders that are coming in. But of course it also reminds us that the people behind the camera are also outsiders who are coming in, who are also implicated in this whole machinery. And the thing, the moment that I find really interesting is this moment here where the photographer meets the eye of the cameraman. And I think that's quite a kind of revealing moment, it's quite an interesting moment, which reminds us that we have to think about cultural production as an industrialised <coughs> system which extracts value from its labourers, from all of those labourers, the paid cultural workers and the unpaid participants. And once we start to think about it in these terms, we can start to imagine different kinds of alliances, different kinds of solidarities, start to recognise the compromises and the complicities that cultural workers feel required to make in order to weather the precarity of cultural work and to generate the value that they need in their CV to secure the next job. It's not that I want to defend these photographers who storm into the street. They are pretty dislikable. Um, but I want to complicate the, the choices that have, that have sort of been held out to us already, seeing poverty porn as good or bad, seeing these poverty porn makers as good and these ones as bad, and instead to think about the kind of contested experiences of working within this industry. So by widening out this sociological focus uh, and to frame poverty porn uh, or dispossession TV as produced within conditions of industrial cultural apparatus, we can start to ask other questions. So not, is this representation good or bad? Is it representative or not? Is poverty porn good or bad? To, uh, but to ask instead about how the conditions of industrialised cultural production in themselves work as a machinery that operates through precarity through anxiety about future work, about future careers. And in doing so, to think about how that machinery itself compromises workers' desires to make more difficult or challenging or complex TV and scripts and reproduces more sort of low-risk, common-sense narratives about precarity. And I'll stop there. Thank you.